Hello, I'm David Crow with my co-host Terry Michael. Welcome to How Positive Are You, episode 29, in which we interview Peter Duisberg. Hey, David. We're really happy to have Peter today, and uh, I want to begin by wishing Peter a happy birthday, because his birthday came just a day after World Afraid's Day. Uh, actually, that's World AIDS Day, but uh, they're very good at keeping fear alive. So, Peter, happy birthday on your 39th birthday. Am I right? It's about 39? Is that it's, right? uh, actually 39 and a half. I, <laughs> 39 I, I and a half. I've him every half year now. Okay. 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 Well, that's okay. Good. <laughs> well, David, let's uh, give him a proper introduction. Yeah, yeah, sure. Dr. Peter Duesberg is probably the most well-known AIDS rethinker. Peter is a professor of molecular and cell biology at the University of California at Berkeley and a pioneer in retrovirus research. Prior to 1987, he was one of the best funded and most highly respected researchers within the virology establishment. Everything changed in 1987 when he published a major scientific paper in the journal Cancer Research, detailing his theory that HIV couldn't do anything, let alone cause AIDS. After that publication, he was unable to get government grants and publication became very difficult. This culminated with his recent paper, Accepted in Medical Hypotheses, which caused an outcry by pharmaceutically funded dogmatists, the firing of the editor, and the closure of the journal. <clears throat> Peter has been asked several times to recant his opposition to the HIV equals AIDS equals death dogma, but has steadfastly refused despite the devastating impact on his career and status within his university and virology community. Welcome to the show, Peter. Welcome. Uh, it, it is. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be positive about those. Yes, <laughs> about and, our positions in this. And, and so, was that a fairly accurate uh, summary? Very good, very good. Right on the button. Most of our listeners probably know about Peter's work, but let's ask Peter, for those new to the rethinking community, to give us a brief description of the work you were doing from the time you arrived in Berkeley from Germany in 1964 to do graduate study until the time that the mysterious immune deficiency syndrome was noticed among gay men in the early 1980s. In that period of time, what was your research related to, and, and how were you working with, uh, in tandem with, other cancer researchers like Robert Gallo and Luc Montagnier? I came to Berkeley as a, as a young career <laughs> a scientist trying to make a big career in viruses causing cancer. That was the emerging theory at the time, very popular, and in fact one of its proponents, the most notorious proponents and best known, was Wendell Stanley, who won the first Nobel Prize for, in virology. And he was my mentor. And he won the prize for crystallizing tablet mosaic virus in Princeton and uh, Rockefeller in the 30s and 40s. So he, he offered me a job as a postdoc in, the, in his institute, the virus lab at the University of California at Berkeley, specifically to work on the then upcoming, rapidly upcoming retroviruses, RNA tumor viruses, as they were also called. Both, both names are still around. When, when did the word retrovirus come into being? When did we start recognizing that the, there was such that a thing? That was with the discovery of this enzyme reverse transcriptase, this transcribed RNA to DNA. So that was the common denominator of... What year was that? 1970. So it's very... Probably it was in 70, but I think the, no, the name as a group came in in the following couple of years. And, and it was born in a little bit of controversy. Where didn't some people think that it was a bit of a coincidence that David Baltimore got a paper out at exactly the same well, time that, as some that's other That's separate. I mean, that he, <laughs> uh, he claimed the discovery independently of Temin. Our Tamin, uh, right. who uh, had reported it at an international uh, cancer conference in Houston at the time. And all researchers then working on retroviruses said, what's the story, left right after his talk to their labs to check it out. And uh, I guess uh, quite a few of them then co-discovered this enzyme within a couple of months or weeks after this announcement. And that was in 1970, and just a couple of years later, Richard Nixon declared a war on cancer, with yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars of research funds being targeted to the war on cancer. So how did your research then fit into that funding? Well, I had, um, had done some basic work 
on the genetic structure of retroviruses. In fact, I had worked out uh, in my lab, at least, and with collaboration with folk in Los Angeles and essentially competition in, with uh, Weizmann at that time in Zurich in Switzerland, the genetic map of RNA tumor viruses, that they had basically three genes, one for this reverse transcriptase and two more for their envelopes and for their capsids, the proteins that, that make up the virus. So I had that one, and then in the same year, 1970, we had then discovered what was become sort of a po very popular discovery, that some of them that transformed cells seemed to transform cells morphologically and may much like cancer cells, but wasn't really truly cancer, but it was something like it, uh, the so-called oncogenes. These, they were then named oncogenes in the name of, because they, it appeared like they were causing cancer. It was a, a hyperplasia, at least. Yeah. And that was immensely popular because of the so-called mutation theory in cancer. For years and years, people there and still argue what is really the genetic basis of cancer and mutation was always the most popular explanation. People could identify with it, go up with mutation as a change of phenotype. And here was the biggest of them all, a normal cell becomes a cancer cell. that got to be a big mutation. And, so you were working uh, on looking at retroviruses as a possible relationship to cancer. Now, yes. in comes I, into this qu equation, Robert Gallo was doing the same thing. Am I correct? And Luc exactly. Montagnier uh, was... In fact, his... His, uh, his AIDS virus was first named by him, a human T-cell leukemia virus, HTLV. And, and so that means that that makes T-cells grow very rapidly. The T-cells well, are at happy. Least, at least make them grow uh, autonomously like cancer cells, not, not functioning normally. You know. It's not necessarily that cancers grow faster, but they grow on their own on their own rate and do their own thing. They don't function for the organism anymore. They function for their own selves. Autonomous. So you were really in the mainstream of this research of retroviruses related to cancer. With the discovery of oncogenes, I got everything. I got a huge grant. I got the International Academy. I got tenure at Berkeley. And I was rumored to be a, a candidate for the, for the Karolinska Prize. <laughs> you know, you know. Uh, so, Which is uh, kind I, of a pre-Nobel Prize? Like, that was the, I meant, yeah. The, oh, that is the Nobel Prize. Oh, okay. yeah, I had a California scientist, but even the real one, I mean, there were, I, I keep getting now, even now, even now that I consider to be, uh, I mean, almost the Adolf Hitler or the Gaddafi of, of, of viruses, I still get, <laughs> uh, I still get <laughs> annual letters from the Karolinska to name Nobel, Nobelists for the year. And in fact... In that period of time, you had a good relationship with Gallo. He praised you, did he not, in an introduction? Oh, yeah, 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 he did, yeah. He, he, uh, he liked me. So, uh, 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 we knew each other for meetings quite well, really well. We were, he has a good sense of humor. It's always entertaining. And he's also easy to irritate a little bit. <laughs> so, the discussion doesn't get boring. <laughs> well, the Italians, the Germans probably were having a good time drinking, is my guess. <laughs> Very much, yeah. yeah. Like, like in the good old days, in the Axis days, yeah. <laughs> the axis okay. Days. Well, let, let's, let's bring this up then to the point of um, the early 1980s, when um, AIDS reared its head in, among gay men in metropolitan areas, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and people were trying to figure out what cause, causes this. Give us a little flavor of how there began to be this thought that these retroviruses, which they weren't having much success, you weren't having much success relating them to cancer, suddenly now, instead of producing proliferating cells, was thought to maybe be killing cells, particularly CD4 T cells. Yeah, I think that was very much a political move. And Gallo was way ahead of me in terms of politics. He was at the NIH, centrally located, in press conferences, and they were, they were, of course, frantically looking for a cause of AIDS. And ever since the germ theory is popular, which is in the last hundred years, it's the most popular theory in biology and in medicine, the, the success story at all. Ever since Koch and Pasteur, we find microbes and stop them by vaccines and antibiotics and so what have you. 
So had a retrovirus ever been considered the cause of any disease before this? A cancer, yes, in, but only in really in laboratory conditions. That is, in, in a, if you infect a newborn animal with some of these viruses carrying so-called oncogenes, the ones that I discovered, then you got something like a tumor if, if the animal was immunotolerant. But typically in an immune-competent animal, immunity arose and the tumor was gone again. But we didn't mention that too much. Here. But that was sort of a model for cancer, and that's why they were so popular. But outside the laboratory, outside artificial breeding colony, there is no record whatsoever that a retrovirus has ever, ever done anything to anybody in the history of biology that's 3 billion years. And, and that's because, in your view, a retrovirus survives by dividing with the nucleus. So if it yeah, kills yeah. the cell, it kills yeah. itself. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't kill the cells. It, it, it sort of uh, becomes a, a symbiont, if you like, symbiosis or... I guess. This, I guess this might be a good time for our listeners who don't have a background in this science to define what is a virus, what is a retrovirus. Okay. Explain it in terms of uh, genetic coding, uh, and it's, it's, is it a living thing? What, what is a retro, what is the virus? A virus is, a is actually a parasite that itself isn't alive. It's a, a minute piece of genetic information that has figured out one thing and one thing only, how to replicate itself. But it cannot, it, it, it cannot do it on its own. It has to get into a cell to say, make my own. It's like you shift a, a CD or a tape or a USB in your computer. Then it plays that game for lo as long as you push that button. And most viruses are, are doing these. They are essentially autonomously replicating pieces of nucleic acid and make one or two things, like their own protein and their enzyme. They do that at the cost of the life of the infected cell. So they get in one cell, like poliovirus, measles, mumps, herpes, any of those. They get into the cell, make thousands of new ones, and kill the cell in the process. Would it be, this is just as a journalist layman's, definition. A virus is basically a bit of genetic coding written in nucleic acid and sheathed in some protein. Is that That's roughly right. what a virus is? Okay. That's so right. a bit of a retrovirus. How does a retrovirus differ from a virus? It, it differs. It, there's no fundamental difference, but there is a, there's a specific difference compared to some others all, or most others. Uh, in, instead of killing the cell, the retrovirus, together with some others too, like the wart viruses, or the, they do not kill the cell, but they coexist with the cell. They become permanent guests of the cell. You know, they, they, uh, it's not a big deal for the cell if they don't take over, because the cell hosts anyway its own 35 or 40,000 genes to have three or four more or less doesn't make a big difference to the cell. So basically the RNA of the retrovirus becomes reverse transcribed, gets converted to DNA, and, and then gets inserted into the DNA of the nucleus. Is that...? Yeah, that's exactly right. And in fact, if these fossil records, that is now molecular fossil records, are correct, that must have happened hundreds of times in the history of mankind because they say they find elements, semi-credible elements of former retroviruses infections that add up to almost a half percent of our genome. This means hundreds and hundreds of infections that mankind has survived without dying out from it. So it's a string of code that's sequenced in a certain order so that you can then say this is a specific retrovirus if you wanted to, you could, whether it's endogenous in, in the body or exogenous outside a human host reading into a human host. Yes. You know, I, my, I've heard, and tell me if I'm wrong, it's about, the human genome is about, what, three million base pairs? Uh, it, and it's, it's three billion, actually. Three billion. Three billion base pairs. Oh, and and yes, yes. a retrovirus, it maybe is 10,000 base it's pairs? 9,000. 9,000, exactly. 9,000. Yeah. That will be important to something we'll get to later when we're starting to talk it, about it, viral load. You know, it's minute. It's like... We are the Encyclopedia Britannica, and this one is uh, one or two sentences. 
three sentences. So, that's pretty so let's bring us up now to April 23, 1984. Yeah. When Robert Gallo appeared at a press conference in Bethesda, Maryland, with Health and Human Services Secretary Margaret Heckler, yeah. who we've seen the videotape. She was very nervous, and she proclaimed the probable cause of AIDS has been found. We do know, factually, that Gallo had, pub- had been working on a paper but had not published a peer-reviewed paper by that time. Begin at that point to tell me, how, from 1984 until you sort of broke with them in 1987, you came to believe that this theory didn't make sense, that a retrovirus was causing killing or disabling uh, CD4 T cells. Uh, see, the claim was politically well-placed, of course, that they were looking, they, they wanted the cause of AIDS, and most old viruses were booked out, and bacteria also. An infectious cause is always the most attractive for scientists to make and the most attractive to get attention of politicians, the Senate and the congressmen, because they get they are afraid of an epidemic uh, coming up, a, a, a microbial or viral epidemic, and want to protect the people against it and, they, and make money available to the develop vaccines and all that. So Gano had that keen sense and said, okay, this retrovirus is causing AIDS, Retrovirus was a new class of viruses that had never been shown to cause a disease anywhere, but so nobody could prove, say, this is not right. Retroviruses do nothing, or they do this and this. It was just not clinically, this virus wasn't known. So he said, we, here we have a new retrovirus that causes this disease. So, and that flu. Now, uh, the, the political climate was perfect. You know, there, there was... Um, Reagan wanted to be reelected and needed something to show for himself. He said, look, what, you, what do you want? Uh, we have the answer to AIDS. Here's that virus. But those... Okay. Now, l- let me actually insert something here, because it happens that I, sitting here in these 10 square miles surrounded by reality called Washington, D.C., I was press secretary for the Democratic National Committee in mm-hmm. April of 1984 really? uh, when Ronald Reagan was running for president. And we clearly saw that his campaign wanted to soften this thought that Reagan was not being respectful of gay men dying. So clearly they wanted to have some kind of of a policy cover here, scientific cover, saying we're doing something about this, and that is precisely what led to this press conference, was it not? You're exactly right. Yeah. I think the rumor was before he only talked to John Wayne about it and I said, those damn queers, who cares about them? You know? <laughs> that was about the level. And then they said, oh, it's high time, the New York Times is, uh, is on the side of the gay, gay man and you, you should take care of it. Liz Taylor, your old friend Liz Taylor is on the side of Rock Hudson or gay man. You better do something about it. And then so it was a clash of Hollywood and politics that, is what we would so, think. So, totally correct, yeah. Okay. Then Ronnie so, said, what do you want here is Robert Gallo. <laughs> and Robert Gallo had done that for those who knew in the business. That's why I was skeptical from the very beginning. He had identified cat leukemia viruses and mouse leukemia viruses and human leukemia. That all turned out to be horrible mixtures of something or another and never proved to be. Uh, and his fellow Italiano, Anthony Fauci, was working at uh NIH at the same time, yeah, he and did. he became kind of a public face of uh, the uh, HIV equals AIDS oh, he, paradigm. He was jealous of, of Gallo's uh, notoriety then and wanted to have a piece of the action. As an immunologist, he thought we, we the two of them could get together and solve the crisis and both become rich and famous. And in principle, they did, yes. They definitely except became rich and famous. Except that... Oh, interestingly, Anthony Fauci, and I, as, I, as someone who has mm-hmm. been living in Washington, D.C. for 35 years, involved in political communication, in journalism, I had never seen anyone other than J. Edgar Hoover uh, really stay in power controlling a, a thought process longer than Anthony Fauci. For, I think, 26, 27 years now, he has been the, the director of the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He is a survivor bureaucrat, an apparatchik, as they would have been called in the Soviet Unbelievable. Union. You're totally right. I mean, everybody else, even the president, they have their terms in democracy. 
that, uh, that is supposed to prevent corruption and, and to, to allow innovation to take place. We have terms for everything in uh, democracy, except the Pope and the, the King and the Führer and Anthony Fauci. And, and he's never had, in, in 26 years, he's never had a hair out of place on his head. I think he uses cement or something to put his hair Well, put his he hair does have industrial-strength hair, but he also has industrial-strength bureaucratic skills. He yes. has been able to control the purse strings tightly. Did Anthony Fauci ever fund a single pro project, a single research project that question Robert Gallo's theory. Never, no, no, never, no, 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 no. No, he is really like a, like the, like the <coughs> computer in this regard. He talks even, sort of like Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Terminator. You can predict what he's going to say. We are cautiously <laughs> optimistic. We are going to move on. This is a breakthrough. <laughs> and one of the early examples of censorship, if I'm remembering correctly, is you were invited by, I think, CNN to come to be taped and, and when you got to wherever you were you were going, they it phoned... It was Good Morning America. Good James Morning America. John, John London. Right. John London was finally going to sit next to John London. Maybe have lunch with her. Right. And yeah. and then you, you got to New York City and, and they... John, John, John London, by the way, for those of you who are younger, was sort of the... Um, uh, kind of a star of ABC, almost like Diane Sawyer is now. Yes. Exactly right. So you got to New York City, and then they phoned and said there's been a bit of a problem. What happened? Something urgent has come up politically, and um, we wish you a good time in New York. Your hotel and your dinner, everything is paid for, but this time we can, you can't come on the show. We'll have you on later. And who, who was on, what was the political event that happened? Who was on television instead of you? Oh, there was a breakthrough discovery on AIDS that Anthony Fauci described. <laughs> I saw him from my, uh, from my hotel room. On television instead of yeah. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, again, I think as someone who has spent his life for 40 years in politics, in journalism, in political communication, I, it's clear to me what was occurring in that time frame. You had bureaucrats uh, really conspiring with media, mass media types who wouldn't know the inside of a biology lab from a laboratory retriever. That's your average journalist. Yeah. They have no knowledge of science, so they simply went to this press conference, heard Margaret Heckler, uh, <laughs> who was extremely nervous when she announced the probable cause of AIDS has been found, and then they see our esteemed Dr. Robert Gallo, as she called him, come up with this single pathogen theory, and is, which, as you said, Peter, goes right back to 19th century uh, disease theory. And the world embraced it. Gay men embraced it. They loved it, yeah. They loved it. And this is, I mean, really the most, the dream of all respectable biologists, molecular biologists, and MDs. They all dream of finding another microbe or virus, make a vaccine, become rich and famous, and have dates and have their pictures in the textbook. That's the dream of Dan Koshland and Lou Thomas and uh, Anthony Fauci and Harold Warmus, Mike Bishop. All of, all of these diseases are supposed to be caused by a microbe that they find, make a vaccine, and characterize and become famous. That, that's the dream. We have six or seven Nobel Prizes for cancer, for viruses causing cancer. There's not one human cancer that is direct, directly caused by a virus. Indirect, everything is, you know, the weather, the diet, and whatever, the sexual preservation, everything is indirect, but there's not one. But we have five or six Nobel Prizes, 10 million. Now, let's, let's go to the, the whole question of yeah. whether this, whether you want to call it the Terry Michael virus, the Peter Duisberg virus, or the David Crow virus, or the human immunodeficiency virus, you believe, do you not, that there was a discrete string of code that they then said was a pathogen. Yeah. You don't. You believe that they isolated something. Is that correct? Yeah, they isolated just. I would say, put it this way, just another retrovirus. We had by that time, owing to the program that you just mentioned, Nixon's uh, cancer program. We had a virus cancer program at the NIH. Hübner was the director of it, and we there was money showered on all virologists uh, in cancer. We had a virus cancer program, and in that program, hundreds of retroviruses were isolated from chickens and from mice and from monkeys 
and finally a few also from humans. The reason I ask that is that there is an argument within the community of rethinkers of yeah. dissension that has it been properly isolated or has it not. But my question as a journalist always is, well, if it is not uh, pathogenic, why does it make any difference <laughs> if, if it's been uh, isolated properly or not? Yeah, and, and, and it is, uh, well, properly or not, uh, it has been independently isolated, whatever they say, called isolated and cloned in many labs, and they have come up with independent with sequences. Believe me, if they could screw each other, they would do it overnight, but they couldn't find anything different. They found it basically the same virus, variations of it, and the same antibody that was initially made by Montagnier is used worldwide now to these days even. So there are some reactivities there. So uh, it's just another virus. That it, It's not even worth uh, arguing how well or how less well it's not important, as you just say. It's a, another latent retrovirus. We have hundreds you, you call it a passenger virus. In other words, it's hitched yeah. a ride on a human host DNA, and it's just going along for the ride. It's not causing any health problems. Yeah, I call it this way, but I want to point out I'm standing on the shoulder, shoulders of giants in virology who have actually, before this, the CAN system was so uh, popular as it is now, have isolated hundreds and hundreds of viruses in plants, in mice, in animals, in humans that are mostly all passengers. They never cause a disease. But if you mention the word, the word passenger was very popular in the old days when, when, when not every paper had to be a fundraiser and, a, and, and in the press. Now the word uh, uh, passenger, if you mention it even anywhere in your paper, it's a seal of death. You won't get cancer for it. And nobody writes about it. Because Everybody wants to find a virus that potentially trivial. could kill yeah. all humans, and, yeah. and therefore they'll become very, very famous. And then, of course, the search for a drug can start, which is what happened with uh, HIV. Yeah, when, yeah. that's right. Yeah. When they came now, now let's, let's go to the time frame then between April 23rd, 1984, mm -hmm. when the world heard about this possible new dangerous pathogen causing gay men to die, yeah. and 1987 when you publicly started criticizing this. What caused you to speak out in, in terms of the time? What was the timing of your decision to, to speak out against this theory? Well, at first, I did not take it, like most of my colleagues, we didn't take it serious. It was another new virus discovery from the NIH and from Gallo or from other retrovirologists retroviro that would be sort of the story of the day and would be forgotten half a year later. But this one took its own momentum because it became a political, a political item. And so I thought, we thought a little more about it. And you read it in the newspapers about it. You couldn't avoid it. And they attribute all these uh, superhuman or super viral powers to this virus. One of them was it would, uh, was a retrovirus, that, and yet it would kill cells. Now, retroviruses, that was the one thing all tumor virus experts would, would uh, essentially be distinguished by. We were the VIPs in virology because we had a virus that wouldn't kill cells. That was the best starting point for a so-called cancer virus or tumor virus. Because if a virus kills a cell, it, you can count them out right away or you would have to have a very difficult argument to make how that one would cause cancer. The because the virus can't live without being in the living cell, right? Because it's not a living thing. Yeah, and if in, by living in it, it would kill it, that would never become a cancer cell. That cell would be gone, it would be out of there. But if you had a virus that would infect it, uh, infect the cell, and it would survive it, now you could make a case, oh, well, this could cause cancer by adding this and this gene or screwing up this and this gene. So that was... a plausible reason for us retrovirologists to be the VIPs in the business, as I was also one of them, and they get the good funds and the good attention of the press and the papers published, and said, oh, what, now we are saying this virus is killing T-cells. That is completely incompatible with everything I knew at the time and still know now about retroviruses. They don't. They, in fact, depend on the survival of the cell for their own survival. If the cell doesn't survive the integration of the DNA in their chromosomes, doesn't replicate it. If it's a dying cell, they will be dead. 
And well, it depends on this. And the second thing that didn't make sense is, well, where is the virus in people with AIDS? There was no virus in the people with AIDS. Even in Gallo's original paper, only half of his patients had antibodies to it. But antibodies is no virus. Antibodies is just the ultimate antidote against the virus. Actually, I think, I think to be accurate, in his papers, he claimed 90% had antibodies, 50% he could culture the virus. I, I believe that's what was in his original papers. It, I think he said, well, it was a bit vaguely defined that this distinction was made. Well, that suddenly, as far as I can see, he said, for, he said in this paper with his name first in science that 47 or four, less than 50 percent were positive, whatever that This meant. gets to a basic premise, basic uh, uh, point in any kind of inquiry. Does correlation cause something? Does correlation equal causation? And of course, correlation does not necessarily, in most, in many, maybe most cases, uh, equal causation. So he was finding some proteins in the blood uh, samples he had gotten from people who had been diagnosed as having AIDS because their immune systems had shut down and they were getting ill. Ill. And he, in Wait, addition but the to proteins find, he found, Terry, this was antibodies against the virus, not just some yes. proteins. He claimed exactly. there were antibodies, and antibodies traditionally, even now, by all orthodox immunologists, biologists, microbiologists alike, they would say, this is what you need to protect yourself against the virus. Not and then secondly, he was saying, well, he was seeing transcriptase. He was seeing this enzyme, yeah. and that proved that something was going on in these CD40 cells. But we now know, do we not, that transcriptase is not specific to uh, this kind of re reading of code. Well, it, 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 at that level, it would be relatively specific, but we now know for sure that the transcriptase evidence in his paper was complete fraud. It was that, therefore attributed to Mika Popovich, but nobody could reproduce that, and the evidence for it was not found by the investigation of the National Academy and the Institute of Medicine that followed the, the Gallo case. So, so, which is why then many people would say that the virus as a pathogen was inferred from the proteins and from the transcriptase. The that transcriptase was his provide evidence, but I don't think he ever found it there. I mean, at least they couldn't find any data that he had found it. Once you have antibodies against the virus, there is no way you can find the trans reverse transcriptase anymore. And he so that brings us to the question, what is an HIV test? Because there are two types. They're checking for proteins in the blood, or they're checking for uh, viral code sequences in the so-called PCR viral load test. So-called viral what load does test. A P what is an HIV test, Peter? No, no. Well, an, anti an antibody test is certainly as indirect as you can get. By that test, all of us in America would be positive against poliovirus, or at least those who have, are over 10 or 20 years old, when polio was an obligatory vaccine. So we all have antibodies, and according to the philosophy of Dr. Gallo, or those who believe in antibodies, HIV predictors as predictors for AIDS, we would all get polio very soon, and the opposite is happening. And so that's a very, very, very indirect protein uh, evidence, and certainly not evidence that anything is going to happen soon. Rather, the opposite would be the uh, evidence. Now, the nucleic acid evidence by this poly by that you mentioned, the so-called viral load, is a very de deceptive wording. What you do, you look for traces of viral nucleic acid left from past infections or in possibly latently infected cells by amplification with the polymerase chain reaction. There is which so was, little... Which so was little. invented by... Uh, the, that method was invented by Kerry Mullis, who tells us it can't be used to... Well, uh, it, 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 it can be used for anything you want, but to, uh, for anything you find only with that method, and that's, an, that's, that's the key here, you can find these re residues or, or fossils of a viral infection, the pieces of nucleic acid, only with the polymerase chain reaction, and only after amplification by 30 cycles. That's 2 to the 30 or 10 to the 10. That's 10 4 billion. Is about 10 
billion fold amplification. So you find something there in the blood of millions of cells that is there maybe in one out of billions of cells in the body. And even there it's not active. So if this, if, if such a thing would cause death, we, we wouldn't even end our conversation here. We have one uranium or strontium or whatever it is, or even cyanide molecules in our body any time of the day. But that, that's a very different uh, thing from the supposed treatment for AIDS, where the initial doses of AZT were more than one molecule of AZT per cell in the body, or something in that in that but area per day. Now we are mixing up, no, we shouldn't mix up treatment with evidence for virus. Right, but all I'm saying is you're saying that the virus is, is present in only tiny quantities, and yet... No, no I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm saying not the virus, uh, not okay. only a piece of nucleic acid can be found. Okay, the traces of the virus are, even the traces of the virus, not real virus, are present in tiny quantities. My point in was... minute quantities, that right. means billion fold let, 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 let me let me interrupt as a journalist here we're going to right. lose people in the weeds here and yep. getting too much into this let's move ourselves up to the 1990s when dr well, okay. david ho in can, New can York we start comes up. We, we have to talk about ACT. we have well, to yeah, go that's, to, well, that's what I, that's what i want to do okay well that was 87 in the 1990s dr david ho was saying hit hard hit early we had been using azt in the late 1980s to in, a, to, in theory, attack a retroviral pathogen that was causing the immune systems to break down. We now have a new theory with D David Ho coming on in the 1990s that we need to... There are millions of these viruses being created, millions of, uh, um, of T cells being created, and they're in a battle. We need to hit hard and hit early with... AZT analogs and proteus inhibitors, the cocktails, in order to um, uh, strike quickly and uh, protect uh, gay men from uh, a future death uh, 10, 15 years away. I, what I've tried to do there is summarize that period between 87 and about 1996 when we started getting, as you call it, Peter, AIDS by prescription. Yeah. Peter, give us a little bit of a discussion of AZT and how we got to that point uh, of David Ho and hit hard or hit early. Well, see, AZT was thought up by virologists. I think Gallo was one of them, and Proder and Bolognese were on these original papers. Said, what could we do to inhibit a retrovirus, one that makes DNA? And they said, oh my God, the best thing would be to inhibit DNA synthesis. Isn't that a great idea? And it seems to be a great idea. Uh, but the problem is the cell makes about uh, 100,000 times more or almost a million times more DNA than the virus does. So, but they were not thinking about the cell. They were only thinking about the virus. And they claimed they had conditions in their laboratory where they could kill the virus without killing a, a cell. That's a retrovirus model, not this one. Or some, or, or some, and growing in some cultures. You know? And and if if I can interrupt just briefly, the the significance of this is that uh, for people who may not be so up to date on on uh, the biology and genetics, is that there are cells in your body that have to divide on a regular basis, such as red and white blood cells. And in order to do that, the DNA has to divide. And so a drug like AZT would attack the division of normal cells. That's what you're saying, Peter. Yes, of course, yeah, any time, yeah. even if the cells are not divided. But it's highly toxic. It was invented and designed for cancer chemotherapy. To and we, as we know, cancer chemotherapy, a doctor gives a cancer patient maybe six weeks of treatment, trying to kill fast-growing cancer cells and hopefully not kill the patient and then bring the patient back to uh, health. But what David Ho was proposing was to use this, these AZT analogs and these new protease inhibitors to, in effect, give a patient chemotherapy for life every day for the rest of their life. What are the implications of doing that? Uh, very, very bad for life. <laughs> <laughs> as bad as yes. I mean, if you terminate DNA synthesis, it's the central molecule of life. What do you expect? Exactly what you, what you put in there. You terminate cells. 
and we are 10 to the 14 cells. Not all of them we need all the time, but every day you terminate them, what's going up is not going to last. Very and, and one of the major side effects of AZT was anemia, right, Peter, which is a type of... That was one of the first, yeah. yeah. One, it, you see that first. When you run out of red cells, you run out of oxygen and you essentially suffocate. That was the so-called primary side effect in the original so-called placebo-controlled uh, trial headed by Margaret Fischel. Right. Now. But doesn't it also kill white blood cells? Yeah, sure, sure. And those are what, what uh, you know... But you can, in principle, live without any white blood cells. They're only uh, like, like immune-deficient mice or immune, there are some immune-deficient people as long as you don't get infected. But you wouldn't but have you, an immune system if you did you, that. See, you could live without an immune system in an ideal world without microbes. Uh, at least for some time with penicillin, antibiotics, and all that stuff. But without red cells, life is very, very, very tough because you, you simply cannot pick up oxygen. Right. Let, let's use this point, at point to then go beyond this, the theory, which we have discussed how really crazy the theory was, I think, at least in my view. And tell us, Peter, what are the alternative theories or theories about how, why gay men were having their immune systems collapsing. If it was not a retrovirus, what was it? Well, see, uh, it, 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 the epidemiology of AIDS, by now and even then already, excludes um, a new microbe or new virus. The germs, uh, the so-called germ theory, the, the, the microbe, the, the, the theory that microbes and viruses cause disease, uh, make uh, make very clear-cut predictions. They say a new uh, microbe comes in the population, and then it spreads exponentially within weeks to months, kills or, uh, kills or renders sick a lot of people, and the survivors now are resistant or dead. The, the susceptible ones are dead, and the survivors are resistant. The epidemic disappears. A classical example is the Spanish flu that rose for two or three months in 1918, killed 20 million people and then declined, and then the globe was immunized against it and it was gone. The same thing with the seasonal polio epidemics in the 50s and 60s, and gonorrhea and syphilis epidemics in the past, and the plagues in the medieval days all followed that pattern. New infectious agent spreads exponentially, kills and the sick a lot of people, generally in the population, not just boys or girls or homosexuals or heterosexuals or or, uh, or, or, or car dealers or scientists, no, random. Microbes don't, they're not very picky. Not picky Which made this new retrovirus of Robert Gallo a really smart retrovirus for, to have only 9,000 bits of information. It could tell you if you were gay or not. <laughs> and we were told by the National Academy and by the Institute of Medicine and Michael Heckler and all of these scientists, and Joe Sonnerman, who have studied it and investigated it, it would have affect uh, or search in general coup. It would have infect everybody because it's sexually transmitted. Everybody who had sex or was interested in sex, and it would rise exponentially and essentially decimate America and then the world, and it would be transmitted sexually. Now, 26 years later, there is no general sexually transmitted epidemic in the U.S. It has always remained to these. Specific, in these specific risk groups, nothing has happened. Uh, women have not had gotten AIDS, heterosexuals didn't get AIDS, kids didn't die from AIDS. In Europe, in America, in the US, in India, in South America, nowhere. It's only two, uh, one or two risk groups that got AIDS. Some very small percentage of male homosexuals, those who had used tons of drugs for sex and parties, and intravenous drug uses. That was about all there is to it in Europe, in America, in Asia, in South America. Africa. Now, let, let me interrupt here to say that Peter has been the advocate of the theory that the um, use of poppers, the use of nitrites, the use of a variety of, of drugs was a principal cause of the immune collapses in a subset of urban gay males. Now, uh, I would know... By the way, include ACT. Yes, yes, yes. And, and then, then the next drug that gay men were using was AZT. 
1987 doing exactly the same thing. There, there are two other factors that we should note here that also, as a 62-year-old gay man, I can tell you I observed in the early 1980s, not only were we using a lot of party drugs, and that could be alcohol as well as uh, cocaine or amphetamines, we were also screwing like bunnies. We were passing around incestuously in an urban enclaves old pathogens for syphilis, gonorrhea, hepatitis, um, all kinds of things, and taking fistfuls of antibiotics, all of which can be immune suppressive. We were also in that time frame. We were also becoming the uh, targets of the religious right. We were fearful, anxious, uh, depressed. We were a hated minority. Um, any neurobiologist or, uh, can probably tell you that there is an immune suppression from a lot of, uh, of uh, stress, from uh, fear, from anxiety. So you have kind of three factors that could come into play and in maybe the way an insurance company actuary could, uh, could tell us that uh, could collapse these immune systems. So you didn't need a retrovirus is the point that we all make in the, uh, in the uh, descending community. That is a very good point, eh? That's a very good point. And a retrovirus couldn't would have done very different things. It would have not stayed with the gay man. Uh, it would have moved right on to heterosexuals or to a, or, or the Catholic Church, as we know now. They would have been devastated, decimated, the, all the way up to the cardinals. <laughs> um, Peter, yeah, we have about five minutes uh, left in our hour, I just want to point out, David. Yeah. So yeah. we may want to come to... Um, uh, finding out what Peter is doing currently. And, well, I, I uh, want to ask one more question before that, and, and that is to, to say that, Peter, you started to do something that wasn't within your scientific job description, and that is you started helping people who came to you asking about your opinions of AZT and other drugs. And a lot of people are familiar with the Nagel family. It's well documented in the movie House of Numbers where they had a two-year-old daughter on AZT doing very badly and you told them stop the AZT. They did and they, they now have a 19 or beautiful 19 or 20 year old uh, daughter who they would not have had uh, without your assistance. Can you, can you think of one more story like that where you were asked about this, uh, you gave some advice, and then you later found out what happened in the situation. I use, I get letters uh, every, almost every day, but certainly three or four or five times a week of people who said they stopped taking these drugs as a result of what I wrote or what they read about me or heard about me and corresponded with me. Right. And they say they owe me their lives. Right. And are there some in the particularly, is there another one that particularly sticks in your mind where you were able to follow up later and find out what happened? Well, isn't, uh, one was at the AIDS conference was Hartman. You remember him? You know? No, no. Tell us the story. I, I don't think. Uh, well, I mean, he came to the AIDS conference uh, in Oakland, you know, the one that right. went, like several others, and he said he stopped because of me. And. Uh, his partner is dead, and his, many, oh, his friends is dead, and, and he's trying to convince many others, but he said he has never touched any of those antiviral drugs since, and cut way down on party attacks. Certainly the, the poppers were completely out, and right. he's doing fine now, 20 or 25 20 years 20 or 25 years later. Yeah. Yeah. we got about two minutes left in our hour. Okay. Peter, tell us what's in your future. You're uh, 39 and a half years old. Uh, what, are you, what are you doing now? Right now I do cancer research. I do still a little AIDS research, like this one paper that David Cole mentioned that we, that points out that there were no epidemics as we covered briefly anywhere in the world, not even in Africa, general epidemics. And, but it's uh, almost, it takes a lot of time and it is constantly censored. Nobody will, even when it, after it was published, it was taken out already. That I've never heard of in my 40 years in time. Yeah, I think that was a first when, when they actually unpublished uh, published the, the research on the basis of unsubstantiated claims without any kind of a hearing. An anonymous claims, yeah. Yes. It was a total Nazi move. I mean, they closed the shop, they threw out the editor, and they, they censored another paper, just uh, put in a whole new political ideology. 
Well, uh, listeners, as we end this hour, we have on the line with us a really good German. Not that kind of good German who just went along with the state, but a German <laughs> national who decided we're not going to let this lie live. And, Peter, thank you so much for all of your work, and thank you for being with us on How Positive Are You? Well, and thank you for being with me. I mean, uh, it makes such a difference to hear some people who want to take it serious and want to move it on and, uh, and, and you know, see that you're not only a, bad, a good German. Yes, yes. <laughs> Th thank you so much, Peter, and thanks to our audience for listening to Episode 29 of How Positive well, Are You? It was a real pleasure. Yes. yes. Thank you. And to our audience, remember to check out the show website, http howpositiveareyou.com. Uh, okay. No, no, uh, I'm talking to the audience, but you, oh, well, you too, I'm Peter. You too. Yeah, yes. you're part of our audience, yes. Uh, you can register for a free account and join the discussion following each show, and that's where we'll post a link to this show, to the audio, and links to other websites. We appreciate uh, everybody's support, Peter's, the audience, and we appreciate your feedback and suggestions for improving the show and new guests. Goodbye, everybody.